question. Do yeah. you think from this that you can deduct, is it wise to believe then that we, are, we can sort of uh, assimilate some sort of meaning or purpose to our life, or is that just egoic? Well, well basically, um, this is, this is an, this is, this is a, these are discoveries ongoing. You know, it's, it's the, the, um, the scientific endeavor um, is ongoing, and where it's going to lead exactly, I don't know. And what relation did ha all, all, all that it says to the individual, I suppose, is that in fact, uh, um, when people like Stephen Gould say that in fact, you know, we are an improbable twig on the edge of an evolutionary tree generated by chance and all that sort of thing, right? At least this is countering that uh, that that thrust, right? Mm -hmm, you think? Mm -hmm. And it certainly suggests that in fact, um, it points to the old cos cosmos of the, of the pre-scientific age, right, where humans and individual humans, you know. Well, I mean, they used to read horoscopes, right? You know, astrology is another example of that pre-scientific idea that we fit into the universe and we have some relationship with its overall structure and things. Like so, as far as the individual is concerned, all the individual can get from this, I suppose, is that that the movement of modern science is back towards the ancient teleological view of the world. So it's very, very. So I mean, it's quite exciting. But again, you're, uh, what I feel like I want to glean from you, the wisdom yeah. that I want to glean from well, you, because you seem to have synthesized quite a lot. You see, you, you come from a strongly scientific background, and you're passionate about the relationship here of these beautiful atoms, and yeah. how they're, you know, in nature, in the universe, and in the body. So, do you believe then, again, because we assign a significance to our life for whatever reason, is that a foolish practice? I don't think it's, I thought, I, when, I, when I first started my scientific career, I started off as a Christian fundamentalist, and then I left the whole thing when I went to medical school. Because, you know, you know, the human body has some design flaws in it and all sorts of things, and, the earth, and I realized that man was out of Africa, and, you know, we were a primate and this sort of thing. But lately, in the last 20 years, um, no, I've, I think that, in fact, uh, we should be careful about writing ourselves off, you know. Uh, we should be very cautious before we dismiss the possibility that... that um, the, the cosmos is, 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 is manifesting some moral, intellectual, some sort of purpose, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that that's, I think it is now manifesting something like that. I think that's where well, it's going. My, my understanding is that evolution is happening in spite of us, even though we're part of it. It doesn't seem like it really requires, I mean, we, st we came from something before we had this level of consciousness, oh, sure, you want to yes. call it, or mm -hmm. understanding. But I mean, how did we show this sort of entropy, if you will? Or this, you know, progression. You know, how did we get here, and where, where are we going? I mean, there seems to be some form well, of I, I would say that directionality. This, this, this line of evidence definitely supports that idea that we're going to discover more directionality, more inter, in, intelligent causation in the nature of things, right? You know? Right. And 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 it might come right down to individuals and everything else. I mean, it's, you know, it, it looks to me as if the whole process of the disassembling. Of the pre-scientific worldview, the anima mundi, right. <laughs> sort of you know the Sistine Chapel, all exactly. those ideas, which were disassembled by science. It looks to me as if it's starting to move back to those sort of ideas again. Yes. Right. I think uh, for me personally, when I get into astronomy and I see how small we are, when you said stardust, that's why I started this recording. I'd love yeah. for you to elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah. I really would. I'm very curious about that. I believe, for me personally, that there's got to be some form of understanding that we, like I said, glean. That's why I love to ask mm. questions. I want to glean yeah. some kind yeah. of wisdom. I believe we all have to bring a contribution. Yes. Obviously, this was so different. There's different yeah. different gifts we have to, yeah. genetically and whatever we're bringing. And so I want to learn and yet still maintain a certain platform mm -hmm. of intelligence, yes. you, know, yes. you know, as well. So yeah. how, do you, how do you, the stardust piece, I mean, can you elaborate a little bit more on that just because that's, I found that quite it's, fascinating, well, almost poetic, i got to be honest with you. you know. It's very poetic, yeah. Um, in the talk, actually, I've got a slide where I show the, the, the Aboriginals in Australia, they used to believe that, in fact, they looked up at the stars at night, and, of course, in the outback, it's very clear nights, right, because it's a very dry climate and so forth, and it's milky ways right across the sky and everything. And they used to say that the, the bright stars are the campfires of the ancestors who recently departed. And the dim stars for those that went earlier, right? It's a beautiful thing. It's an absolutely beautiful thing in the dream time, right? It's mm -hmm. a far more wonderful thing, of course. That's, a, that's very mythical. It's wonderful, yeah. And basically, of course, what, what modern science has shown is that the Aboriginal sort of idea um, is not 
not it's it's not exactly correct, but there's a very much it's much closer to the truth than most of the scientific ideas from 1600 to 1900. Wow. <laughs> you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because there is a connection between those aboriginals and those lights in the sky, a deep connection. They need those lights in the sky now. They need them just as they are. That's perfect. <laughs> because why? They're hints. They're hints. Well, they're strong hints. They're yeah. strong, like, it's strong Very hints. strong hints. The whole thing, yeah. <laughs> no, I, you know, and I think when we start appreciating the hints that are in nature, yeah. You, you, yeah. you know? Have you seen that? I'll show you the Hoyle quote, actually, which is, in fact, uh, one of the... Um, one of the interesting, uh, Hoyle, Hoyle says this about the cosmos, and um, uh, where does he, um, no, I'll get okay. it, let's see, I know this thing off by heart now, yeah. this is his full, full quote, energy levels needed in order to produce carbon in large quantities are statistically very unlikely, and so are all the other conditions which must be right. Or later wrote, would you not say to yourself, some supercalculating intellect must have designed the properties of the carbon atom, otherwise the chance of finding such an atom through the blind forces of nature would be utterly minuscule. Of course you would. Common sense interpretation of the fact suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as with chemistry and biology, and there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. Oh, think, th think of the stature oh, of this guy. That's wonderful. Right? The, number, the numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this question almost beyond question. So, I mean, that's, I mean, you know, you've got to remember, this is the Plumian professor of astronomy at Cambridge University. I mean, you know, a very controversial figure, of course, Hoyle, you know, in some ways, uh, and pretty eccentric.